everybody and welcome to the NBA show Discuss. This is James Cork, the movie guy that tries to draw. And with me I have the podcasting machine and Plains Walker extraordinaire Norman Sanso. Today we watch movies. And then we proceed to read the power of them. <laughs> That's not a word. Um, that's not a word. I didn't say the word. Shut up, Norman. <laughs> and we also have the man, the myth, the hypocrite, or some brownie reviewer, Silver Quill. Sweet movies. Who's scaring me right now? Who are you? And what did you do with Silver? My hatred for these movies runs deep. <laughs> oh, no. Your <laughs> rage. <laughs> Instead of a top five, he's going to do a bottom five. <laughs> uh, That's all right. Uh, I'm telling the spirit of strong bad. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Come on. There, there weren't that many bad movies this year. Well, no, weren't they? Uh, we shall see. We shall see. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And, and this, this time we're going to do something really, really new. So, because it's a new format, new way of structuring the show, we're going to pretty much play it by ear, but we're going to try and keep it interesting and poppy for you guys not to fall asleep while we're talking. We're talking. So, um, we're going to be talking about what we consider are the five best movies that we've seen all year. Then we will talk about the most surprising, m- moving to the most disappointing, and finally, we're going to scrape the bottom of the barrel and talk about the worst. So yeah, we're going to keep you waiting for the one that you guys want to hear about. <laughs> we're devious. Anyway, because I am on the command chair again, we're going to go invertible, inverted alphabetical order, and let's not waste any time. So, Silver, you go first. What, uh, like, what will be your number five best movie of the year? Number five, Avengers, Age of Ultron. What can I say? I, I love this action romp of a movie. It's, again, it's the Avengers coming together and they're having, uh, one-liners and action fights, these great scenes. They play off one another. They, we all get to see them suffer a little bit of emotional damage, except for Hawkeye, who's already been there, done that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get, we get Shield being what it was supposed to be. None of this spy nonsense. Now it's we need people need help. Here we are, and for and once again, it just feels like things are building back up to it, and it just shows the, how the Marvel Cinema Universe has really become its own entity. And so, in some ways, I enjoyed it more than the first Avengers. In some ways, I enjoyed it less, but it's still really stand out, fun time in a movie I would gladly see again. James Spader for Evil Robots Overlord, I support. <laughs> What what were your thoughts on Bishon? Very briefly introduced. He had funny lines and a nice scene with him and Ultron talking at the end, but he's in he is introduced to the movie so late that it's hard to really become attached to his character. Well, I think they did it pretty well by him picking up Thor's hammer and him and Thor interacting with it. Like I think that's what made him a bit memorable in some parts. Yeah. Well, God, an elevator can lift Thor's hammer. Is the elevator <laughs> worthy? <laughs> but still, but still, like... It, 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 it was a joy to see that Paul Bettany, the guy who did the voice of Jarvis since the very first Iron Man, was the guy who played Ultron. I mean, the guy who played Vision, because he was he was perfect for the role. Mm, I, I honestly, he looks like Vision. Have you read the comics? Yeah, just the thing. I, I don't really know who's how the story unfolds in the DCU uh, because... Oh, you just made a lot of comfort fans mad. Okay, not DC. I don't know because I, for, for me, my knowledge of, <laughs> of Marvel movies are from the this Disney cartoons that they show. Yeah, so it's, it's so ma- it's so bad that for you, like Bruce Wayne works for Stark Industries. Mm-hmm. No, <laughs> I know that. I, at least I know that. Come on. And the knowledge I have is from what Link Kara and what Disney shows me. So that's about it. Well, that's all you really need. Yeah, true. Yeah, you don't need more than that. So, well, Norman, what about you? What's your number five? Huh. I, I'm trying to scatter my brain for a five here because oh, this year I only watched 12 movies. And, well, some of them are okay. Some of them are bad, but... Let's say my number five is going to be Kingsman, the Secret Service. Ah. Ooh. It's a pretty choice. 
it's a pretty fun movie. It's about this kid who grows up to become, oh well, not really grows up, who's selected to become a quote unquote spy. And it has Mark Hamill in it, so yay. <laughs> but overall, I like this movie because it's a Bond S kind of movie told in a different point of view. The hero we got here is kind of a street punk who he's getting there, he's going to the top, he's learning the ropes, but he has a heart of gold. So yay. And also Kingsman Secret Service is based on a comic, which goes by the same name. And there's a few things interesting. I like this movie and Samuel L. Jackson's in it. So yay. <laughs> I didn't know that it was based on a comic until you guys told me about it. I was like, wow. It is based on a comic. This is yeah. the second comic that is adopted by the same director. It's the same, it's the same guy who did Kick-Ass, right? I think I, so. I think so. Yeah, yeah. And but, that, that mind-blowing ending. Hmm. Oh, mind-blowing. <laughs> you, you just purposely did that, didn't you? Of course. I took that from Silver's review. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh, but you, honestly... You owe me a, you owe me a quarter. <laughs> I owe, no, I think I owe you more than that. I think I owe you a full dollar. <laughs> uh, but... <laughs> Honestly, the the movie here, it's fun. There's a lot of fun facts behind it, like um, the villain sidekick. Originally, the character was supposed to be played by a male in the comics. Uh, and then they even wanted to hire the Paralympian who doesn't have both legs and he'll be perfect for the role, but eh, he didn't. And a good thing too, because he went psycho and eh, read the news, you'll be, you know. So yeah, this movie is fun. I say it's there, the top five. All right. Uh, my fifth best movie of the year is... um, it, I'm not cheating because I watched it in the theater this year. It came out this year. It's coming out in the U.S. around this time. And it might not premiere until 2016. But it's a, it's a Spanish-produced movie, Spanish-directed with international actors. Uh, my fifth favorite movie of the year is A Perfect Day. It's a movie starring Benicio del Toro and Tim Robbins, and it's about two it's about two plumbers that go help on uh, on an armed conf- conflict in the Balkans during ni- in 1995 in the middle of the Kosovo War. Their mission is to take a, a corpse out of a well uh, on a village to prevent the well of the water of the village to go corrupt and uh, poisoned. And the entire, the, when they're taking the corpse out of the, the well, the rope snaps and it breaks. The entire movie is their odyssey to look for this rope, to get the corpse out of the well and help these people. And in the way they will fight bureaucracy, they will be escaping around, away, running away from the militia and the guerrilla, they will have to uh, get around political minefields and literal minefields. And in the end, it's actually, it's the most uplifting, positive, and hopeful movie I've seen all year. It has one of the best messages that, uh, that I have ever seen is that as long as you are doing something for a good purpose and you are helping others, even if you think you are not helping, what little you do amounts to a lot. Because to the last minute, the movie keeps you in this kind of like despair, kind of like, uh, uh, negative atmosphere, but in the last minute it resolves every single plot point, every single storyline, and it leaves a very good aftertaste. So, uh, it's coming out already in the US. You guys should definitely check it out. Tim Robbins and Benicio Toro do a fantastic job, as they always do. It's a movie that I highly recommend. It's a great movie. I take go. that you guys are not familiar with it because. Uh, nope. <laughs> nope. I'm afraid, uh, I'm afraid this one has gone off my radar. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's it's the problem when you have a movie that is uh, produced in a in a country and then it's taken elsewhere. Because this was like produced and shot in my country, but it's not been taken to the U.S. or other uh, other countries until now. But it's coming out. I highly recommend you to watch it. Uh, something to keep my eyes open for then. Yes, definitely. So, uh, Silver, what's your number four? The Martian. Oh, <laughs> oh. bring him home. Oh, uh, what can we say about this? Well, okay, funny. Story, haha. Uh, during Interstellar, all right. Spoilers for it's, the. It's a, it's a year, man. You can totally talk about it. Well, if if, if anyone hasn't seen uh, Interstellar yet, I'm going to give just a little bit of a spoiler. There's a scene where Matt Damon's character basically uh, messes everything up and through a airlock, and as he's breathed his final ah, 
Someone in the audience says, Matt Damon. And the whole theater just starts chuckling. <laughs> now, take that moment and extend it over a movie. And that's part of what makes The Martian so appealing. It is Matt Damon turns in this great performance, basically acting by himself. He's alone for like 90% of the movie. Yep. Yes, he is. And you'd think this could give way to boredom, but everything, the tension throughout it, the the desperation, that feeling of isolation on this planet is there. And yet through this uh, style of humor, this defense mechanism, you, you realize that humor is not just a distraction. It is a coping mechanism. It is both for the character and the audience because the situation is very dire. Oh, yeah. Okay, can I say something? Please. The Martian is my number two. <laughs> ah, <laughs> The Martian is your number two. I, I have to say some this as well. The Martian is also my number four. <laughs> Aha. No, we, are, we are all of one accord here. Yeah. I, I don't know why. Because this movie, I didn't expect much out of it. Because I didn't know anything. Like, that's good. Because I went in blind. So, after watching it, during the whole presentation and whatnot, like, this is Beth Damon's best performance. The line, I'm going to science the... That's Word? Out of this is awesome. It is really awesome. Every nerd out there just fist pumped in the air. It's like yes. It's like, by the way, the nerds save the day in that movie. <laughs> and Project Elrond. Oh. <laughs> without any, without any revenge. Yeah. Nerds are cool. Yeah. Ner- uh, nerds are super cool. Yes. Yeah. And, and the best part about this movie for me is just like. The pseudoscience they use is quote-unquote real and not real at the same time. They try to keep it as real as possible. Much like Interstellar. Uh, well, Interstellar is, uh, is they, they are two completely different beasts. And I have seen people uh, uh, comparing the both, which I think it's unfair. Interstellar is a fascinating movie on the concept and the story. The Martian is a fascinating movie when it comes to the the realism of it and the characters. At least the, the way I see it. Matt Damon here play a really awesome role as, uh, I forgot the main character's, uh, main character's name. Matt but Watney. Matt, yeah, <laughs> Matt. Mark, Mark Watney. Mark yeah, Mark. Watney. Yes. So, uh, he played a really, well, Matt Damon played a real good role by himself doing the things that he do. It's pretty interesting. It reminded me of I Am Legend, where Will Smith has to act by himself. Oh, and he's so much more likable than I Am Legend. Uh, true, true that. But still, uh, I do enjoy the things that he does, and it's just so good. I I don't know. Like it's my number two. May I say that this is by far the best science fiction movie that Ridley Scott has ever directed, and that's mm. including Blade Runner and Alien. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I thought he had he had given up on science fiction after making Prometheus. Thank God that he made this movie. <laughs> is this even science fiction? Because it's kind of yes and no at the same it's, time. It's science. It's I think it's. It's science fiction, more science than fiction, but it's sci-fi. There is a there's a genre of science fiction called hard science fiction, which is a very much based on actual technology, taking it to where we believe it could go, whereas opposed to faster than light drive and all that good good stuff that is fun, but I'm sure physicists would say that's not possible, and I, <laughs> and I would say shut up, let me enjoy my Star Wars. <laughs> What if there is sound in space? You don't know that. You haven't been in space. Uh, oh, man. Uh, I saw a movie try to do no sound in space with explosions. It did not work. It did not work. Yeah, like yeah, it it didn't. Uh, you want a good movie that knows how to do no sound in space and everything? Watch Gravity. Actually, watch Interstellar as well. Interstellar does the whole no sound in space really good too. I'm George, <laughs> I'm George Clooney with a rocket pack. We <laughs> How can that movie be? You don't forget, but Matt, uh, the character Matt or Mark. Mark was it? Mark Watney. Yeah, Mark. He was Iron Man for a bit. Yeah, I got to yes, fly like Iron Man. That's just awesome. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Uh, I just love the part where he goes uh, uh, legalese and like, oh, uh, according to this, I'm a space pirate. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be called Blonde Beer. <laughs> <laughs> And then, of course, there's always, Mark, you are on national television. Please control your language. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, needless to say, you'd think being stranded on a planet, you'd enhance the boredom. I mean, that's actually a very realistic concern that the movie would be 
tedious. No, no, the strength of these characters and all that they do uh, just made it a fun, fun movie. Really, really good. I mean, if it doesn't win something that come in the awards season, I'm going to be outraged. I don't really care. Severely outraged. <laughs> well, well, what about your number four, Norman? Because well, we didn't talk about that one. What, what yeah. is your number four? My number four is going to be Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation. It seems that I'm going for, uh, what you would call this, uh, spy movie kind of uh, thing. And, yeah. Well, it's difficult not to. This year was the year of the spy movies. There were like, what, ten? There were like James Bond, The Man from Uncle, uh, a spy, like you said, Kingsman, Secret Service. Yeah. The Man from it Uncle. Had a lot of spy. Oh, that's also a movie yeah. I watched. Damn. Mor- so, yeah. Mordecai. Of, Mordecai, Breach of Spies. Yeah. yeah, it's ridiculous. This year was the year of the spies. I, oh, I, I thought Mordecai would get more of a groan out of you. Oh, I didn't watch it, no, man. No, well, it's Johnny Depp. After that, I think it's kind of like everything is grand. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm Johnny Depp playing Johnny Depp. <laughs> I'm Johnny Depp playing Johnny Depp. I am the most overpaid actor in Hollywood. Did you know that? <laughs> but yeah, what about Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, man? What do you think of it? It's kind of cool. Like I like where they're pointing this movie at. The squad that Tom Cruise is in, I forgot, what is it called, their group? I don't know, I forgot, but... The, the Impossible Mission Force? Yeah. Yeah, the, I, the IMF. Their group, like Tom Cruise IMF. I don't know much about the MI lore, but having them having a counter team to counter him, and just, ah, I, I, I'm not good at explaining, but this is kind of a fun movie where Tom Cruise's character is limited to what he has, and he uses everything to his power to find the real culprit and stop them. It's fun. That's all I can say. It's fun. I'm really bad at this. It's a it's a fun, enjoyable movie. It does know how what to do with the with the spy genre. Yeah, but it's fun. It's a, it's a fun action movie where it's balanced out with humor and fun action scenes. Like as per usual, you have Tom Cruise crazy stunts and whatnot, and it's just fun. I don't know what to say. The resolution for the movie is pretty smart too. And James, your number four was The Martian, right? Yeah, my number four was The, was the Martian, so we don't need to talk about that one. Uh, mm-hmm. So what about your number three, Silver? What's your number three? Uh, that would be Ex Machina. Oh. Ex hmm. Machina. This one, I this one, uh, wasn't sure what to think going into it. I knew very little about it. But you watch it, and it's just this tense, there's drama, there's questions about humanity, there is a heartbreaking ending. I mean, it's just, it's just like, ah, oh, ah, oh, no, ah, oh, yeah, oh, no, yes. ah, oh, ah, uh, it, it, oh. It, it's an ending that hurts. <laughs> it's an ending that hurts, and you kind of feel like, hell yeah, this is kind of how it had to go down, but also, oh, you, yeah. Every character is great, they, they fill in a great performance, they have a villain that you kind of love to hate, and yet at the same time, you kind of admire him. For what he's accomplished, but not, but also what he's doing is so morally questionable at best. And it was, I, I'm afraid I may bring this up as my most surprising movie, just for what it, how well it did its job and how intriguing it was. And the, it's sort of the classic sci-fi trope of artificial intelligence and what does it mean? Could we, would they be our friends or would we, or would they hate us instantly? There's all those questions. But they, but it puts a nice fresh spin on it through a very sympathetic character. You know, I thought I was going to be alone on this one because Ex Machina is my number two. Ah. Oh. I, I absolutely adore this movie. It was my favorite movie of the year until number one came in. But yeah, I, I adore this movie. It, uh, I also love how it takes the whole, uh, the, the comparison between the guy who is creating this artificial intelligence with the work of Jackson Pollock, like the guy has a Jackson Pollock painting on his office and he's looking at it, he's like, Jackson Pollock didn't know what he was creating until he, until he stepped back and he looked at his canvas. It's very similar to what this guy is doing. It's like he doesn't realize what he's creating until the inevitable happens at the end and everything crumbles down before him. Like his creation gets away, uh, get, gets control of him and gets away from his hands. It's, it's very poignant. It kind of defines the mind of the creative personality. <laughs> that sometimes you can get possessed by the thing that you think you are in control of. The way that you're talking about this movie is, um, is it similar to that one movie where this guy falls in love with an AI? Oh, her? Yeah. Well, no, not really. 
it's not so fairy tale ish. It's mm-hmm. more like a like a nightmare, I'd oh. say. Okay. Yeah, this one, this one, it's a heavy one. Yes, like th- th- there is there is a lot of themes going on in this one, and it's it, it's also the most r- remarkable thing about this. It's the first movie of the director. It's directed by Alex Garland, the guy who wrote Twenty Eight Days Later. He's also oh. the writer of it, and. The work that he does with this movie is like, God, I cannot wait to see another movie directed by Alex Garland because he did an amazing job. It's also very minimalistic looking. I love the production design. It's very, like, austere, very empty corridors, very, uh, what's the word? It feels like a hospital room, you know? What's the word to describe a hospital room? Um, Shiny. Or an insane, or an insane asylum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very much like that. And it's like the way, it's very bright and very colorful as well, but, it's like that because the darkness is in the, in the inside. <laughs> it's uh, very it's, it's it's terrifying. It's very minimalist, very sterile. Hmm. Sterile. That's the word. Sterile. Yes, yes, it is. Also, you can see it as a quip to social networks because one of the plot points in the movie is that the guy who's creating this AI, he's building it on the infrastructure of a social network that he created to develop the way that people behave and the way that people act. So from there, he develops an artificial intelligence program based on how people behave on the internet. Although there weren't enough emoticons to say that. Lol, pong. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and John. Well, that kind of explains. That kind of explains the ending. Then. <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. But yeah, what, what about your number three, Norman? What's your number three? My number three. Let's see if I can cook this right. Return my treasures to me, and I myself will carry you to the gates of Valhalla. Tss, you oh. will ride eternal, shiny, and chrome. So you say that you watch Hello Kitty the movie, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, Mad Max, Max Fury Road. Mad Max Fury Road. <laughs> Road trip the movie. Yes. <laughs> Chasing the movie. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's a Roadrunner cartoon. I know. Uh. I, I don't know what to say about this movie that haven't been talked to death about. Like, a good example, or a good point of view I could point you at is to go and watch um, the Nostalgia's Critic review on it. Because whatever he says is true. I like this movie because it's just fun. The characters, the scenario, the whole universe of Mad Max is just fun. And having them do the things that they do in this movie... It's just insane. Like, those people who were just on sticks, those were practical effects. And the key for this movie is we try to do it. If we can't, then we'll use CG. And more and more movies don't do that anymore. And this movie tries and does it. And it's cool. I'd never say, like, this is a fun movie that is basically an an hour-long chase scene with pausing the middle for character development. Yay! And one of the coolest guitar guys. You are not metal enough to match this man. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, nobody is metal enough to match the weird-ass guitar guy. Yeah, (laughs) fun fact, fun fact. The war boy, that guy, the mask he's wearing is actually his brother's face. Ew. Yeah, that's how insane this movie is. Okay. (laughs) You know, I want to know more about the production of this movie because I heard that... Something called a car launcher was included in the production of Mad Max Fury Road. And I'm like, first of all, there is some company that makes something called car launchers. There is a business for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Second, I want to know how many times they used it because all of the stunts, all of the special effects, there is so many practical effects on Mad Max Fury Road. I'm surprised. It's so cool to see something that actually works, that is not made with a computer, especially in the, in this day and age where we live, we live in the post, post George Lucas, Michael Bay, Peter Jackson era where we have to put computers onto everything. The fact that practical effects are making a resurgence is just joyous. Like we were talking about Interstellar. You will be surprised how many practical, practical effects are in Interstellar. That, uh, that black hole thing at the end of the movie, that was practical. Wow. That was not CGI. Wow. <laughs> so the the fact that Mad Max Fury Road brought back as well in the in the in the action genre is good. It, it's it's a reason for to celebrate. Mm-hmm. And the only reason why people use CG nowadays is to be safe. And if you watch this movie, and most of the effects are practical, 
how are they no deaths in this movie? That's a surprise and that's good. My one thing is, it's weird watching that movie, and this is why I'll spoil now that Fury Road did not meet my top five. Neither did mine. This might take us off very far, of course, but there was a book out there called The Way of Men. And it's written by this guy who totally <laughs> believes that men need to reclaim their masculinity and be super macho and beat everything up. And mm. at, at first, he actually makes some very valid points until you actually think about what he's advocating. And the funny thing is, Immortal Joe's world mm -hmm. is this guy's wet dream. <laughs> It's oh, where, absolutely. It's where guys show their, prove their value and their, and women are treated as things. Cattle. As cattle for breeding. Mm -hmm. He talks, this book talks about equality, restoring equality. The sex is baloney. This is where men use violence on to assert their will over everything, including women. So when I watch this, it's like, oh my God, this, in some ways, I guess the book actually turned me a little bit away from the movie. But to me, when you say that, like to me, this movie, well, I, I don't say that it empowers women for that, but to me, this is just one of those movies where, okay, the lead of the character is female. Why? Because there's a story behind it. It's not about girl power. Yay! There's a real story. She has a, a motive. The fact that she's a woman plays into her motivations, but it's not just women can do things better than men. Oh, we're so independent. No, she she also relies on Max's help. Yeah, there's a few scenes that where the female protagonist asks for Max's help. And Max being neutral here, like, I want to get this stupid mess off my face. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Okay, whatever, as long as I get this mess off my face. That's his only motivation for the first few minutes of the show. You see, but Mad Max is like that. He has been like that. In the, like, I think it was George Miller himself, because I'm pretty sure this all comes because of the uh, all of those men rights activists saying, "Ah, oh, this movie is empowering women. You are taking the character of Mad Max away from us." Like, Mad Max has always been like that. The character of Max has always been like that. At the end of the movie, he ends up being as bad or worse than he was at the beginning of the movie. And he doesn't usually get so involved. He's more like the observer. There is one scene where he's uh, he's seen uh, Furiosa talk to the to um uh, to the the women that she's uh, taken away from uh, in Morton Joe, and he's just looking around like Ma Ma Max is just looking around like huh 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 huh, and he doesn't know what the hell is going on because he got himself wrapped up in this situation, which is what happens to him in every single Mad Max movie. <laughs> That's the character of Max. I think the best way to look at it is like this. Max is an analogy for the viewers. He's us. He's basically the silent protagonist in your video game. Um, consider it to be uh, Half-Life. He's the Gordon Freeman to us. We just <laughs> do the things that need to be done. Why? Because characters around us need our help. That's about it. Yeah, I mean, Mad Max didn't make my, my top five, but I liked the movie. I thought it was it was fun. My number three is... um. Steve Jobs, <laughs> the yeah no it, the movie called Steve Jobs, the one that came out this year, directed uh, by Danny Boyle and written by Aaron Sorkin. This movie is going to have a special place in my heart because it's the movie that I watched when I was at Bronny Scott 2015. Well, uh, we ha we had a choice between two movies, either Steve Jobs or Spectre, and I decided to leave Spectre to uh to when I came back home, uh watched it. I thought it was really disappointing, but Steve Jobs surprised me. I'm pretty sure that everybody remembers, or rather don't want to, for, to, don't want to remember that terrible Jobs movie with Aston Kutcher as a Steve Jobs. He did a terrible job in it, but no, this, this, uh, this movie was surprisingly, surprisingly good. I went into it not expecting anything, and it, it's a film that takes the persona of Steve Jobs and basically humanizes him. They talk about uh, his friends, his boss, the uh, his family, the, the wife that he never liked, and the daughter that he he was fighting with himself about technology or not. And it, the way that it's structured is perhaps the most interesting thing. It's all uh, focused on three events: the launch of the Mac, the launch of the Next, and the launch of the iMac. And before the launch of each one of those co computers, he talks with these people that form his life, like his publicist. Uh, his friend Steve Wozniak, the CEO of Apple that then got got kicked out, uh, like I said, his wife, his daughter, and, and all of that. 
And because it's a structure like this and it takes place before it's one of the launches, a movie that is literally two hours and a half, two hours and a half flew by in a blink. Like, I didn't look at my watch once while watching this movie. And by the time it was over, I was like, wow, how long was that? Two hours and 30 minutes? No, impossible. It's just people, because it's just people talking. And somehow it's so fascinating and so interesting. I wanted to know more. Uh, but I think the thing that surprised me the most was Michael Fassbender as Steve Jobs. Because I don't remember Steve, uh, I don't remember Michael Fassbender in that movie. I remember Steve Jobs. He got in the character so much. It's, it's terrifying. <laughs> By the end of the movie, I didn't know that it was an actor. I thought it was a Steve Jobs that, that, that got revived and put in the movie. <laughs> so basically he wore turtleneck and jeans? Uh, by the end of the movie, yes, he's wearing turtleneck and jeans. But and it, and the way that it's uh, done as well is very interesting. In the first segment, it was shot in 16 millimeter. In the second segment, was shot in 30, uh, 35 millimeter, and the last segment is shot in digital. So as the technology improves, so does the the quality of the picture. I confess, I've not seen this movie, so I can't comment. Other than the big thing in the wake of Steve Jobs' death is. Yeah, he did a lot, but man, that guy was a jerk. Mm. Yeah, was that's, that, 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 it, it is true that uh, Steve Jobs, the way that people may remember him, is um, as a full of himself uh, nerd who said, oh, I changed the world, I invented the future, I started in a garage, and I created an empire. And this movie basically takes him and it makes him a human being. It makes him flawed, but it also makes him surprisingly likable. That at the end of the movie, you, Anna, you actually believe the, the relationship he has with his, with his daughter, which is something that not many other movies, in fact, no, no, no other movie has actually uh, decided to follow. So, yeah, you know, I, I highly recommend you guys to check it out, if only to see fa fantastic good performances. Like, get, hell, Seth Rogen plays Steve Wozniak, and he, he acts the hell out of this movie. He's so good. He's on the same level as Michael Fassbender. He's fantastically good. So, okay. yeah. I, I think, personally, for me, this movie might come out next year for my country, probably. That's the, that's the problem. Maybe you guys didn't see it because it had a limited release. It was out in, like, 20, 20 or 30 theaters. It wasn't all that spread out. I was surprised to see it in Edinburgh. I was like, holy cow, they have Steve Jobs. I need to watch this movie. Hmm. <laughs> but, yeah, that's my number three. Uh, we're, we're getting on to number twos. Uh, Silver, what's your number two? Him. Star Wars, nothing but Star Wars. Ah! These are the Star Wars brand new movie, which is really good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I need to say something. Uh, Star Wars, my number one. Kind of. Fit. Wow, mm. it, it's the number one on a lot of people's lists, uh, with good reason. I I wasn't sure what to feel going into this. I remember the hype for the Phantom Menace and. Wanting to believe that it was going to be this grand new thing. And, <laughs> and yeah. But this one, going in with somewhat tempered, maybe a little bit more jaded expectations. But I do agree with the criticisms that the, uh, that the movie follows the, the steps of the original Star Wars movie very closely. Very similar setup. I think it's banking on that. It's trying to say life is cyclical. Here is our starting point. And as Harrison Ford points out, there's always a way to blow these up. Well, I was saying Harrison Ford instead of Han Solo. This is what I, this is what <laughs> I become, it becomes synonymous. Uh, I, I love the new characters. I first, that was my biggest concern. It's like, oh, am I gonna, am I really gonna like these new characters? Ten minutes later. Yes, yes, <laughs> I do. I like Finn. I like Ray. I like BB-8. I like them all. Uh, am I the only one who thinks that the character of Ray looks like she escaped out of the Hayao Miyazaki movie? Especially because of that beginning. Oh. Oh, the Mononoke Hime. <laughs> well, she, she's a she's a great character, and like I say, there's humor. That's one of the big things that takes a surprise. There was humor in the in the original trilogy. There was an attempted humor in the prequels. His mm -hmm. name was Jar Jar. <laughs> but this one, it 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 sort of accepts that these characters are playing off one another. Humor is in the story rather than in just one character. Oh yeah, I. I do see the humor they are trying to pull off here. Like, a good, okay, spoilers, spoilers. If you have not seen this movie, please go watch. But spoilers. <laughs> With that, 
uh, there's this one scene where Kylo Ren is just angry because uh, Rey escaped, and he like any like any tea temper tantrum, he trashed the room. Two stormtroopers walk. One of them says, <laughs> "Hold up, hold up," and then like sees, okay, backing up, backing up. Nope, get out of here. That was funny. That was funny because they played off the scene instead of trying to force it with droids. Yes, and we also <laughs> see stormtroopers do have survival instinct. Mm. And heaven forbid they actually came off as very threatening in this. Oh yeah. Yeah, and they they are capable. I mean, they cannot they, they cannot aim for nothing, but that riot that riot stormtrooper, oh, Drydor, that, that, <laughs> he became a mean on his own. Oh yeah. Oh, do you know there's an official reason why uh, the first the first Star Wars uh, stormtroopers could not shoot straight. You you know what the reason is? Their helmets. Why? No, their blasters were defects. What? Yeah. <laughs> But hang on, Luke and Han got their hands on those blasters and can shoot bullseyes. I don't know. Oh, you see, they activate and they work properly when they are held by main characters, not when they are held. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, that's what they say. I'm not sure. I'm just saying, uh huh. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, of course, uh, but with the Force Awakens, I will say, towards the entering the third act, when Han Solo started talking, oh. I started saying, "No, you fool! That's a death like stop." That's another death like stop it, you fool, you fool. <laughs> uh you and you know he was dead when he walked on that bridge. Like uh he's dead when he walked on that bridge. He sealed his fate. I I all I knew is he was gone the moment he said goodbye to the princess. It wasn't all bad, was oh, it? Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, it you know you know that the the explanation behind that is because Harrison Ford was getting sick of the character of Han oh, Solo. Yeah. He wanted him to die in episode five. And they, they, they didn't want him to die because the production company said, no, 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 Han Solo is the most popular character in the entire movie. We cannot lose the most popular character in the entire movie. So, yeah. But honestly, I think that was a good decision by the market team in I episode agree. five. I agree. The way that he died in this episode it was the best way for him to retire that character because that was, oh, it was just too good, too good. Hey, everyone else is there. We still have Mark Hamill. We still have Carrie Fisher. We have Chewbacca, R2-D2, C-3PO. I mean, it made sense that Harrison, Fo that Han Solo, I did the same thing that you did, Silver. God damn it. That, that Han Solo would end that dying. I mean, <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying that the way that they told the story here, okay, it's a, it's a scene by scene storytelling for episode four. You have, the mentor dying, which is Obi-Wan. Now it's Han Solo. And then in the end, Luke finds a mentor, which is, uh, Greenfeller, who is named, uh, Yoda. Yoda. And in this, Ray finds, um, Luke. So they're playing it safe, which I don't mind because it's kind of making sure that, hey, we want to make big money so we can carry on to episode eight. So, which they will within 18 months. Yay. In due time. In due time. It will happen. It will happen. Oh, well. So, uh, okay. So, your number two, Norman, was the Martian. Mine was Ex Machina. So, let's skip straight to number one. I told uh, you, you my number one. number one. <laughs> yeah, your number one is Star Wars. So, Silver, what, what's your number one? Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Woo! Wow, yours as well? <laughs> I thought he was going to be alone. <laughs> oh, yeah, that makes sense. <sighs> oh, oh, gosh. Oh. Uh, my favorite. Okay, here's the thing. Star Wars. I love it. I adore it. But I have to ask myself, okay, isn't a lot of my enjoyment based on nostalgia of the originals? And is that fair? Well, actually, that's very subjective. Sometimes if a movie as Everyone cheered when something nostalgia came up in Star Wars. You pan over, you see the Falcon people cheer. You hold the training remote, I giggle. Uh, you have Carrie Fisher, Princess Leia come on screen. A wild applause. So the nostalgia is a very real factor there, and I think it's a mistake to discount that. But Inside Out was a brand new movie that offered emotion, heart, great insight into the mentality of growing up, humor, sympathy, uh, just a marvelous movie. I'll, I'll be honest that I didn't really laugh, laugh until the end where we were seeing all the insides of people's heads, but it, that doesn't matter because I was fascinated start to finish. 
And I think if I watched it again, when I watch it again, there'll be uh, more humor because now I kind of know what the rules of this head are. So your number one is Inside Out. So is mine. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. And I absolutely agree with you. It is true. You, there is. I don't remember laughing out loud at any point in the movie, but it was fascinating to look at. The, the abstract thinking when they go into the subconscious, the dreams are a, a production company where they film they make movies in there. <laughs> That's that. It, it was a really, really interesting movie. Where, when you think about it, it they it, there there is no villain at all. There is no bad guy, and the conflict to it it's very low stakes, but it's such a big deal. Well, because you care about the characters. This is the well. Bring it back to ponies season finales where they have end of the world issues. Like, okay, yeah, objectively, the end of the world is a bad thing. But sometimes you're more emotionally invested in the end of one character's life than the world. Like, if we were to relate it to ponies, uh, I will say the stakes on Amending Fences will be higher than the stakes on uh, on <laughs> on the QT remark. Because I, I, I care more about the character of Moondancer than the character of Starlight Glimmer. We will get to that when we get to that. But in this movie, they, they it's it's definitely about... And it, it's very clear as well, when something like that happens to someone, like both joy and sadness go away and you just feel anger, bitter, and especially you're scared of the situation that you're facing. So even from, from that perspective, the movie is very cleverly put together. It is true that they had uh, psychologists or psychiatrists uh, helping them on the way that the movie should be structured, right? Yep. Yeah. At, at least one child psychologist, I believe. Uh, also, god damn it, Bing Bong. <laughs> god damn it, Mr. Bing Bong. <laughs> you, you will cry for a fictional character within fiction. It's 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 ridiculous because at the beginning when you first uh, when I first saw him I was like, oh, what is this? This is so weird and silly and ridiculous. And by the end of the ah, I can't stop crying. It's so sad. Oh my gosh. But yeah, it's a. Uh, it, will you call it the best Pixar movie? One of. Uh, I'd have to see the I'd have to see the Pixar movies closer together to say. I mean, Wall-E had its charm. The Incredibles had great charm. I think I might put up just a little bit ahead. For a certain fact, good Lord, the, the, both these movies have brought me to tears. You oh. empathize with the characters so much. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Up in the first ten minutes. Up in the first ten minutes. God, I'm just, just let the world die. <laughs> uh, we, we laugh, but when we're watching the movie, it's actually heartbreaking. It's oh, so Ben doth cry. But but it's it, it's the good thing is that it's a feel good cry. It's like oh my god, I'm crying so much. Why does it feel what so feel right? good? I feel sad after looking at that scene. Is that up? Oh, gosh, <laughs> no one think about it. No, next scene, next scene. Well, think of the little boy scout getting dragged across the glass. There, that's that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. No, but the the uh, uh, with uh, with Inside Out, it is true. It's too early to to call it the best of anything. Like I mean, it's not even a year old. Up is already six years old. We could say I would say Up is the best uh, out of all the Pixar movies. Uh, Closely, I will say, closely followed by Ratatouille. I mean, at, at least on my personal, my personal perspective. But uh, I, I will put Inside Out in between those two. It's in between Up and Ratatouille. I will put it in between those those two movies. Well, I will say it's not too soon to declare Inside Out the best movie of 2015 for me. Oh, true. oh no, it's not 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 soon whatsoever. I think it is definitely the best uh, 2015 movie for me as well. Very clever, really put together. But the one thing that I really liked about Inside Out. I didn't mention this, and I am going to make a statement right now. The best thing about Inside Out is that it doesn't talk down its target audience. Like, it's animated, children are going to see this, that's that's good, but it doesn't treat children like they're stupid. It treats them with a lot of respect. It doesn't talk down to them, and that's because Pixar knows that children are not stupid, that children are smart. Because they will question things, they will ask things, they will talk about things, and they will figure out things, even things that we as adults don't even think about. That's why I hate so much the, oh, it's a children's cartoon, so as a hand-waving excuse to excuse poor quality in writing and poor quality in animation. 
so it's because it's for children, it's supposed to be bad? No. And that's why you have production companies like Pixar that don't talk down on children, that they treat them like they like what they are. They are smart. They are wide open wonder I am I want to know more about this. I want to find out more about this. And that's one of the reasons why I love that movie. It's so good on that regard. There you go. Sorry. I had to say that. Oh, please do. So <laughs> no, no problem. I've I've about said my piece on this. Uh Norman, I fear I have shut you out of the conversation here. No, 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 no. I mean for me I haven't seen Inside Out yet, so I Gasp. <laughs> what? The Norman? Gasp. Norman? <laughs> Oh, man, do we have to have the talk? No, it's just that I didn't have the time. That's about it. But <laughs> oh, you don't have the time. Sir? Hang no, no, okay. And Silver, go see Silver, it right now. Silver, have you watched A Clockwork Orange, Silver? You set up the chair with the eye opening uh, things and everything. I will go get the eye drops and the no, movie. No, okay, here's the thing, here's the thing. Inside Out is now available on DVD and Blu ray. So I'll probably pick it up. It's, well, it's wow. one of those movies I want to watch. Why are you still here? Because I have to do a review. Well, that's not an excuse. We'll give you a pass, man. Go. Be free. Grab it. Watch it. Love it. <laughs> well, I will. I will. But, you know, there's the one movie that's coming out this year that nobody's talking about. It came out on the same day as Star Wars. Oh, no. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> we're gonna, we are going to... Well, now that we... <laughs> He wants to talk about <laughs> Alvin Al- uh, and the Chipmunks, the road chip. Ah. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. So with that bad taste in our mouth, so what should we do yeah. now? Uh, well, we talk about our top five. Let's talk about the most the the movie that we find the most surprising of the year. You did say, Silver, that yours was Ex Machina, right? Yeah, I think so. At the at the end of the day, I didn't know what to expect. But I was like, whoa, this is surprisingly deep. I I did not think it would be this heavy or heartbreaking really hit all the right notes to make me love and hate the main heroine and feel sympathy for both the the protagonist and the antagonist. It is really well put together on that on that regard. And again, I was expecting something like that coming from Alex Carlan. So I I went into it not expecting anything and I got a lot out of it. But I think I had lower stakes on others. Uh, what about you, Norman? Do you have a most surprising movie oh, of the year? I have a few. I have a few. Ooh. Ooh. I want to know. You have to pick one. You have to pick one. <laughs> oh, come on. Like, I, Okay, I'll see what those are, but I'll pick on one to discuss. So, um, Good. I, I, I am going to do the exact same thing, yeah. so you're not alone. Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. Because, okay, let's see. Uh, I have Jurassic World, then Terminator Genesis, and Ant-Man. And the most surprising one that kind of surprising that's in theaters is um, My Little Pony Quest Your Girls Friendship Games. <laughs> That one didn't really came out in theaters, man. It did. September one, 17th. One or two. One or two. Yeah, I'm surprised that it came out in theaters. That's the thing. Okay. I'm surprised. And I'm <laughs> that, not going to talk that, about that, that that's one. A loop, that's a loophole if I've ever seen one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not going to talk about that one. Um, The movie that I want to talk about is Ant-Man. To me, Ant-Man is an interesting character. He's not the best role model. Hank Pym. He's not a good role model at all. Like, remember what Silver said about raising the hand to discipline the female part of the human race? Yeah, yeah that's Hank Pimp. Well, that's Hank Pimp on the new comics. Oh, not comics. the oh. classic Hank Pimp. The classic uh, Hank Pimp was an awful person. Yeah. Oh, it's the other way around. Okay, yeah. I didn't, I, 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 someone explained it to me the other way around. Well, because they said, oh, they didn't go with the new version of Hank Pym, who's basically a kind of too a, because abusive in, guy. Well, they've, he's always kind of been abusive. That's the sad thing. Yeah. So, I'm glad that they didn't went with that because I don't want to have a superhero where he's bad. But this one is a bit different because you still have Hank Pym, but he's not Ant Man per se. He's the mentor for the new Ant-Man, which is kind of cool, and which I like. And he has a character to his own. He's an ex-con who is a whistleblower. And because of that, he went to jail. And he meets this cool guy. Uh, who's that guy's name? I forgot. But he's the Hispanic character in the show who is funny as hell. And then 
the movie goes on. Like, I'm surprised that I enjoyed this Marvel movie, quote unquote. Like, nobody was really expecting high hopes for this movie because it's Ant Man. What could they do? Well, apparently yeah, the they concept, did a lot. The concept of Ant Man, just by the name alone, it's very silly. But I think after this one, Marvel can get away with anything they oh, want. Oh no, they got away with Rocket Raccoon. Yeah, but even after Rocket Raccoon, this is Ant Man. It's Ant Man. <laughs> What? How do you make a movie like Ant Man and make it work? Well, first of all, you get you get Edgar Wright as the writer. You you get the guy who wrote oh. Scott Pilgrim vs. the World and the before Cornetto trilogy. That, before, who wrote the movie. Yeah, before that, there's problems with this one because the original writer for Ant Man, I forgot his name. He had a different vision for this, but Marvel said no, we don't watch you. So took another guy. So this movie had problems too. That's your more surprising one, man. Yeah, I, I'm surprised that. I like this. I like this character and I can't wait to see more of him. And the way he took down Falcon, that's pretty cool. Falcon, the Avengers. Come on. Yeah, it's funny we remember Falcon more than we do the uh, Hornets. You mean the Yellow Jacket? The Yellow Jacket. The Yellow Jacket, yeah. Uh, I was so... The Yellow Jacket was was so mad. I remember his death. His death was really fun. Yeah. Like, he got absorbed into himself. I do remember Yellow Jacket, but I, I don't know. I mean, Yellow Jacket in the Marvelverse... It's actually Hank Pym. I don't know. It's a long story, which is not canon to this universe, so I don't want to tell it. No point. What's yours, James? I do have a couple of mm, surprising movies on my list. Like, I was also surprised at Jurassic World, and t- I was too surprised at Ant-Man, and, uh, and, uh, and a few others. But I think the most surprising movie of the year is perhaps the one that is going to cause people to get mad at me. But I'm going to say it anyway. My most surprising movie of the year is Unfriended. Unfriended. Uh, unfriended. Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead, Silver. What, what are you going to say? Only that I've not seen it. I know the premise. I know that it's probably one of the most economic movies of of the uh, series season. Yeah, it, it is. It, it has a budget below one million dollars. It's the movie. It has Ooh. a devious concept, and it's really cool. It's it's basically it's a horror movie that takes place in a Skype call, and at no point in the movie. You leave the Skype call. It's all the. It's all seen from the computer screen of a of a girl, who is meeting up with her friends through Skype, and they are talking on the anniversary of one of their friends' suicide. And the ghost of the friend starts haunting them through that Skype call and starts attacking them because them together they they six got together to bully this girl through both social networks and on their high school. And to me, Unfriended came off as the most brutal finger wagging movie about <laughs> you see cyberbullying. You, you stop that. <laughs> to me, it's a, I love that movie because it takes the, the current teenager generation and it tells them, this is what's wrong with you. You have to stop doing it. So yeah. while some people in the, I was watching the, the, the movie with a couple of, uh, with, uh, with a couple of people in the, in the theater and they, they were the target audience for it. And I was watching it with them. They were horrified, terrified and everything. And, and I was here giggling like, <laughs> you are going to go back to your Facebook and start apologizing. I'm pretty sure no. of that. And it's the, the thing with the movie is that, uh, the last 10 seconds had a bit of a, uh, a bit of a screw, screw you. I hate jump scares. And they put a jump scare in there. I'm like, ah, oh. that, that's a, that, that's the only bummer that I gave to the movie because the rest of, uh, the rest of it is, uh, not only very economic with the scares, but it's also very economic with the gore. I'd mm-hmm. say there is only one gory scene. And even then it's, it's, uh, edited with glitches and uh, lag. They are, they are very smart about using the lag in the movie as a way to create tension. Because at one point the camera of one of the guys gets frozen and they cannot see what's going on. They only get the frozen image. And then it suddenly, switches to something else that is a violent jank of the camera and it's, and it's like, what happened there? And you can only hear people chatter, chatter in the back and it's like, oh my God, what's going on? It's really cool. It's an hour and 20 minutes long. It's very short. I highly recommend it. And also, you can consider it a found footage movie. It's the only found footage movie that will not give you motion sickness <laughs> because uh... the, 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 the screen is... It's static, it's fixed, but it's very interesting. I really, really enjoyed uh, Unfriended. The box office uh, gross for this movie was uh, $62.9 million. It's not bad. <laughs> for a $1 million movie? It's yeah, amazing. I know. So, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's my most surprising. Um, let's move on to most disappointing. Uh... Oh, boy. 
<sighs> Silver, your most disappointing movie of the year. Okay, here, this year I, I'm proud of myself that I avoided a lot of movies that I thought weren't going to be good. And usually I think I turned out justified in my choices. But my choice is a reflection of the entire genre. I started off this review voicing my hatred of tween movies. Boy, have there been a lot. Insurgent, The Scorch Trials. Oh, boy. And my choice for most disappointing, Mocking Jay Part 2. <laughs> oh, oh uh, my God. What is that that I hear? Silver, do you have you have a mob of people with like f- giant forks and torches at the outside of your house? Careful, <laughs> they it, are the Hunger Games fanboys. Ah, is it Tuesday already? Oh <laughs> wow! Give me a second, Silver. I need to get out and sell some stuff. Well, there you go, <laughs> merchandise. Look, guys. All right, I've realized I've come to have a very negative opinion of most teenage fantasy sci-fi adventures because. They are so horribly selfish. We've gone past the age of Harry Potter where destiny forced a, a future onto an, a young man and his, his cope to, his struggle to reach up there. Now suddenly the world is pushing and pulling because you're so awesome. You're so much better than everyone else. You're so much more special than everyone else. Katniss is a sociopath. Yes, she is. She thinks her pain is worse than the rest of the world. And that, it, so she gets entitlement. She's the one who gets to kill Snow. And there's a scene in the movie where she admits, oh, I got everyone, I got these people killed. And the rest of the group's like, no, no, we wanted to help you. We, we, we knew what was going on. We wanted to do it anyway. It's like, I thought, if I were in the movie, I'd be seeing, yes, you selfish little. That's b- not a word. You <laughs> got our friends killed. You thought your pain was worse than everyone else's. So you got to do what you want. And as a result, everyone else is paying for your mistakes. And the whole point of the movie is so she can see that one tragedy at the end. Other than that, she could have sat at home and the entire thing would have played out exactly the same way. And I just think, my God, what was the point of cheering for this woman? And the fact that she's being celebrated as this role model to young women, this woman who's defined by violence, cares nothing for other people unless it's beneficial to her, and just believes that everyone will fall at their feet in service to her, horrifies me. I just want to know, is the Hunger Game in general, like, isn't it just a spin-off of uh, a Japanese movie called Battle Royale? Which is also it's a spin-off spin- from a comic, which is also a spin-off from a model- it's not, novel? It's not really, no, it's not, a, no, no, you're not doing it right. You're using the word spin-off incorrectly. It's not spin-off. It, they basically take the entire, the same concept, the same premise, and they put it on their own uh, they have, they put in their own ideas, but it's basically the same. Battle Royale was a manga that then got adapted into a movie, and then they saw that and they said, "Hey, maybe we can make the Hunger Games out of it," and they did so. They are the exact same kind of thing. I've not seen Battle Royale, so I can't I can't comment. You on should. Things. It's much better. It's, it's a lot of fun. See, here's the thing: the the first Hunger Games, Katniss is actually a likable character. She's she her only act of true free will was to was to volunteer herself to save her sister. That's a likable, enjoyable thing, and you root for her. After the first book slash movie, her character goes way downhill. Yes, 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 she does. Very, very quickly. And again, I, I really want to do a whole video talking about this, but pain is one of two things. It is a connector in that you feel empathy for others based on shared pain. Kind of like Inside Out, sadness drew people together. It was a connector. But then the truly selfish people believe that their pain makes them more special than everyone around her. It becomes a bubble, an exclusion of the world. And you end up doing really stupid things because of it. And that's Katniss in a nutshell. She thinks her pain elevates her to others, above others. That somehow she's got it worse. When really, a whole nation is propping her up as a symbol. She has power, whether she wants it or not. There are people in this universe who aren't even allowed the, the power to speak, literally. And yet, she thinks she's got it worse. I just get to know, what's the point of the whole series? Like, in Battle Royale, it's all about thinning out the worst out of the children and only leaving the good ones in population. The concept of Battle Royale is floating on itself because the one survivor out of the game is going to turn out either a psychopath or someone that he will not be able to adapt back to society ever again because of the horrors that they had to experience the thing is that 
I absolutely agree with you, Silver, on what you said about the twin movie genre that is going on right now. Because it is true, you have the the Divergent series. You have you, they just finished with uh, the Hunger Games. They have the the goddamn Maze Runner, which I think it's so overratedly annoying. I hate those movies, and it's even worse when they start invading other genres. Because that was the problem with the Fantastic Four movie. <laughs> Fantastic Four is another twin kind of movie they want to do. The, the new one that came out this year, they did the exact same thing. That was one I chose to skip. And I think uh, Jupiter Ascending, which I've heard much about but have not seen, I think that falls into the same trap. Is it this uh, year? I watched, yes, it, it, uh, Jupiter Ascending came out, came out this year. I watched that movie. I I watched it. I got it on Blu-ray and DVD. Oh, I actually God. liked it. If I, oh, uh, what? What? Uh, no, 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 go ahead. Why do you have to say? You let me, you shut up and let me talk. If I had a top 10, if we had done a top 10 in ten, instead of a top five, top five, Jupiter Ascending would have been in that list. Uh, because it, it may look like it, but it's not. It's not more like a twin movie, something like that. It's the fifth element of this generation. But I like the fifth element. But that's the thing. You, th- that's the thing. But when the Fifth Element came out, it got panned by critics. It got panned by the box office. It was the laughing stock of everywhere. Now it kind of became a cult movie because people see it for what it is. They see it as a heavy metal, the comic book kind of adaptation. Jupiter Ascending is the exact same thing. Every generation has a movie like that. Like in the 80s, they had Crawl. The 90s had Fifth Element. Now we have Jupiter Ascending. Yeah, it's not a perfect movie. It's very flawed, but it's definitely not a twin movie kind of deal. I, I can guarantee you that. Oh, well, that's your most disappointing, Silver. What's your most disappointing, Norman? I have two. Oh, you have to pick one, man. I know. I'm just going to list out what I said before. Like, One is no surprise. I shouldn't have expected it to be good in the first place, but I'll explain why. And the other one is just disappointing for a whole lot of reasons, which I will go into. The first one is the Spongebob movie uh, out of the new one. The one with Antonio Banderas? Yes. You thought that was going to be good and you no, were here's the thing. that it wasn't good? Here's the thing. I seen the first Spongebob movie. That one was good or acceptable. In a, in a scale of 1 to 10, it'll be a 5. This one? Yeah. It's just like, okay, I see, but uh, it's funny, but uh, it's like... Uh. Okay, okay, what's your other movie? The one that you'd say is the most disappointing? Uh, the movie that really... Uh, Dragon Ball Z, Resurrection of F. Ah, oh, and I thought that Silver was going to make people mad. They are all going to your house now, Norman. Yes, I, I, I'm going to go out front and say, Norman's over there! <laughs> and that's by, where he lives. And by over there, I mean across an ocean and several continents <laughs> to an undisclosed location that I don't totally know, but I'm sure you can figure it out. You know, fanboys, man, they will find him. They will cross the ocean. They will find him. <laughs> Here's the reason why. I have a special love for Dragon Ball. It's one of those shows where I grew up with it. I enjoy it. Like, the movies were awesome. And the first movie... Uh, Battle of the Gods, which Silver, you have a review on that one, right? I not yet, but yeah. that's God knows one day I will. <laughs> yeah, of <laughs> course. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so Beerus might be watching you. So um, that one, when I saw it, it was like, oh wow, this is so cool. This is so awesome. Yeah. And then when I knew that they did an anime of it, it's like, okay, that movie was pointless and mute. All right. And then like, oh, the Resurrection of F, featuring Frieza. Yay, this is gonna be fun. Watched it. Oh, this is fun. I like this where this is going. Yeah. Not that awesome, but still, it's good. What made me piss off is the series, the animated series, Dragon Ball Super. It kind of blanket over everything. Like, the movies are kind of mute and pointless right now. If they're gonna retell the story in a 20 minute long series, which, with more fighting scenes and more in-depth explanation of certain characters, why do I even want to watch this in the first place? There's no point. It's just a time waste. For me, going to the theaters and just watching it, it's like, why? Why do I even? <laughs> I, I, I... It's okay. It's okay. Relax. There's, there's nothing why? different. There's nothing different in the story. But, 
Well, they, there you go. Sometimes that what they do is they just want to content the fans. No, and by doing it's that, not even they don't that. take any risks. So. It's not even that. Like, okay, hmm. when you tell this movie, when you tell the story for the movie, okay, the movie is the movie. As far as I remember, or as far as I know, the movie canon for Dragon Ball does not fit with the show canon for Dragon Ball. Whatever is told in the movie stays in the movie. You don't see any battles between Broly and Goku in the standard Dragon Ball universe. That's only in the uh, games and movies. That's about it. So to have a movie like this come out and tell the story of, oh, there's a big cat god who is the god of destruction. Be in a series is just like, uh, okay, movie's pointless. And then having Frieza being resurrected in the movie is fun. You need that hook to bring people in. Have him resurrected in the animated series is, okay, no point. I am just pissed off. Silver is going to review the Battle of the Gods and Resurrection F someday. But why would he? It's kind of mute right about now. Like, he should just review Dragon Ball now, the series. Uh, well, here's the thing. I, I actually favor the movies over the series. The series has that classic Dragon Ball padding, which, I'm an old man now. I got things to do. Get to yeah. the punch-in. Move it, move it, you snappers. Here's the thing, Silver. There's no ah. difference. In fact... The okay. series explains a bit more, like how Frieza trains and whatnot, and uh, just, yeah. that's so my movie. So basically, you're saying you're saying is that for you, it's a disappointing time to be a Dragon Ball fan. No, I'm just saying that I spent time and got nothing out of it. I think I enjoyed Pixel more than this. Oh God, Norman, what the hell? At least that's Pixel you're is going new. To make people angry. That I'm kind of angry at what you just said and i am not a dragon ball fan what is wrong with you i skip pixels as well i'm feeling very proud of myself right now like the really bad stuff i managed to dodge matrix bullet time at least wow. pixel was just dumb my most disappointing movie of the year just to move on swiftly like process my most disappointing movie of the year is a movie that everybody hyped i didn't listen to the hype and even with that i got disappointed it's my disappointing movie of the year is it follows it follows. Oh, that one. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, it's, uh, for those of you who haven't watched it, it's basically, uh, an STD stalker. <laughs> it, it's like, the, the concept of the movie is, uh, the, the protagonist has sex with a guy, and the guy is being followed by this thing that is killing people at random, and only the people that have sex with this guy see this entity or whatever it is. And the first, no, 20 minutes of the movie is all right, but then the movie goes completely ridiculous because apparently the thing is invisible, but it's physical. It exists. So it's just an invisible entity. So that means that you're going to be walking down the street and suddenly you bump onto something that you don't see and uh, maybe it's that one thing that was following you. What? What's going on here? Or like, it can get shot with bullets. This thing that cannot be seen and is invisible can be hurt with bullets. What? And that's exactly how they kill it. In one of the most ridiculous, most sloppily put together climaxes I have seen in a horror movie. The only good thing about that, that film is basically the, the John Carpenter soundtrack. And even that is just another, another sign of its identity that I take away because it's like, oh, you don't have an identity. You are just a pile of horror movie tropes put one out on top of the other. And then they decided to paint it a different color. Honestly speaking, the concept for this horror, ghost, whatever it is, is really interesting because an invisible horror that you can But it's not see... a ghost! It exists! You can yeah. shoot it dead! Yeah. No, see, it's not here's, a ghost! Here's the thing, I'm going to say, like, having a concept like that, like, it can manifest itself. It's invisible to everyone else but you. So, it's kind of interesting. But having you shoot it to death is just, no... Just, no. the, 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 it goes only more ridiculous at the end of the movie when they put a towel on top of it and there is a <laughs> you can see the towel floating in the middle Woo! of your movie left and right and the guy with the guy with the gun he goes to it the, to the head of the of the ghost thingy whatever and then shoots it and it, uh, fine okay good you just removed 
all intimidation factor out of this. Besides, it doesn't scare me because I have, I am not that sexually active. While in this movie, <laughs> oh. everyone is porking each other. It's ridiculous. No, okay, here's the oh thing. Oh my god. Here's the thing, like, the concept is interesting, but the execution of everything is just, sounds sad. It is bad. It's badly put together. It's a very sloppily, badly put together movie. And I don't recommend it to anybody. I don't know why people were saying it was so good, so ingenious, and so, so fascinating. Uh, to be honest, I found uh, un- uh, Unfriended way more fascinating and way more scary than this movie. And yeah. it had like a fraction of its budget. Uh, okay. Well, oh my there, there okay. was that disappointment. Well, yeah, let's, let's talk about wars. Let's, let's talk about the wars movies. Wait, so, wars? I thought we already did that. Yeah. I no, that... no, no. We're talking about most disappointing, not worst. Oh. oh okay. The worst movies. Well. <laughs> yes, yes. Worst movies of the year, man. Pixel so, then. <laughs> man, that's, that's hard to say because like I say, I, I can't say that, that, uh, Mockingjay was the worst. I'm I'm very disappointed, very troubled that people who are holding up the Katniss as a role model for young women. Uh, good lord, that's terrifying. The, hmm. Give me some. I need to talk about this in another video. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going by word of mouth here. But I will say, Pixels sounds like it was something that could have been fun and lighthearted and goofy. But because, as the nostalgia critic pointed out. Adam Sandler refuses to change his style to grow with his audience. And he's relying too much on, I guess, younger people who are the same age as his prior audience used to be. They're not going to pick him up the same way. It's Pixels on its own is just disappointing, but as an indication of trying to evolve your humor, it's downright awful. And in truth, I've never been a big Adam Sandler fan to begin with. So to find he's not even trying is equally disappointing. I did watch uh, Pixels on the on the big screen. I went to watch it. Yeah, you actually, you know what? You pretty much put it very well right there. You didn't even need to watch the movie to say that. Uh, it's a uh, it's a bit of a waste of time. It's not my worst movie of the year, though. I have one. I have another one, but it is it is really really bad. Yeah, for me, this seems like the pixel bashing. But okay, I'm gonna try play it positive. Because I'm just gonna try. So, so your worst to... movie of the year is also Pixels. Yeah, because here's the thing: Pixels. Okay. Pixel is a special movie where you need to really turn your brain off, and by that I mean not pay attention to it. It's like the background noise to something that you're doing. Example is playing a video game while the movie is behind. So you're just hearing sounds while kicking ass in games. So. Yeah, it's there. It's not that bad. So, I'm playing something much better while hearing Adam Sandler whine about stuff. So, yay, I that's guess. That's the only way he... That's, that's his acting. His acting is not acting. It's whining. It's not that bad, too. I mean, it's... There is... It's... It's not the great, but it's not the worst. But it's just mediocre. It's just... Uh, yeah, it's not his worst movie, but it's his most... One of the most mediocre ones. Because it's not even enjoyable in the... Oh, it's so bad, it's good. Or it's so, it's so bad, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. No, it's just meh. And for Adam Sandler to do something meh is not memorable. Yeah, I mean, to, to say worse, uh, bad is, bad is so good is Tommy Wiseau's The Room. Come on. Tommy Wiseau's The Room has a special blend of, he's really serious about this, isn't he? And terrible acting from him. And just WTF moments of everything. It even got Emmy Larson to go watch this movie live with him in the theater. So, that's fun. Or Kung Fury. Oh, yeah. Them straight. But no. <laughs> Pixel, it had potential. It had a lot of good potential. It could have been so much better. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, having uh, Dinklebot there was just... Why? Anyway, so that's your worst movie of the year. The, the both of you guys. Damn. Yeah. Wow. Okay, I'm going to break the, the norm, and I am not going to say Pixels, because even though we did watch Pixels, yeah, it was bad, but Saddam Sandler kind of expected it. Uh, I was about to say Fantastic Four, but from what I was seeing and everything, not surprised. I wasn't all, all that shocked that it was bad, because the Fantastic Four movie is pretty bad. Not even in the enjoyable bad. No, no, it's pretty, pretty bad. And uh, Gem on the Holograms is not out yet, but from what I've seen, oh, 
that one, that one reeks from the distance. <laughs> you know it. But no, my worst movie of the year is Chappie. 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 Oh, it's been a while. Chappie. Yes, the the third movie directed by Neil Blomkamp, the guy who did District 9. Uh, perhaps the most annoying movie of the year as well. I mean, more so than Adam Sandler going, yeah, every five minutes. What? Really? It's, yeah, no, seriously. It's a movie about an artificial intelligence guy, that, an artificial intelligence that gets developed by a guy in a company where he builds robots to create an armed police force in the city of Johannesburg. Because all of the movies directed by this guy take place in Johannesburg, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's about this guy who is wanting to put this artificial intelligence program in a decommissioned robot. And in the process of doing that, he gets kidnapped by two gangsters that are trying to use one of those robots to break into a bank and steal money from it. And they force the guy to put the AI program into this robot... And when they put the, the program in the robot, the robot is acting like he, he's like, well, this program, when I put it in the robot, he's going to act like a child because he's, uh, he's innocent and naive. He will know nothing about the world that, that surrounds him. And so the robot is acting like a child. So the two gangsters go, hmm, we are going to adopt this robot. And they adopt the robot. It's like the gangsters are a, a guy and a, a guy and a girl and a, a man and a woman. And the thing is that the two guys, their names, they are the real names. They are a self-insert in this movie because the director is a fan of them. They are uh, the they are uh, part of a music band that the director really likes. So he put the both characters in the movie, and that's just the premise. It's a massive waste of potential. They talk about so many themes that they don't develop. They could talk about. Th there is one scene where Chappie Chappie is the name of the protagonist robot, and he's looking at a cartoon, he -Man and the Masters of the Universe, mm -hmm. and the movie could start like a, a, a parody or commentary about how cartoons in the 80s influenced the culture of the, of the 2000s, but they don't do anything with that. They could talk about what is uh, art the morality about creating artificial intelligence or something like that. They don't talk about that. They could do political commentary about how the, the, this city is relying way too much on armed forces and that is uh, creating a, a line between rich people and poor people. They don't do anything with it. Everything that they touch upon, they don't develop. They throw it at the wall and it doesn't stick. And besides, the acting is very much non-existent. And that's a shame coming from people like Dev Patel, Hugh Jackman, or even Sigourney Weaver, who are in this movie, but it's like they are not, they are non-entities. It's very, very bad. And it terrifies me because this guy is supposed to direct an alien movie. And just looking at this, I am, I'm throwing my hands I'm at my face. I'm like, oh my God, no, don't get this guy approach the alien franchise. He's going to destroy it. It was really bad. I take by your silence that you guys haven't watched it, right? I, no. again, missed it. That was one I was curious to hear about, but as we got closer and the reviews started piling up, I decided uh, maybe I shouldn't. Yeah, you did a good thing because it's very bad. As for me, I kind of wanted to watch it because I kind of like what I saw because it's essentially this robot develops in... Okay, from my point of view, from what I interpret the movie posters and from the part of the trailers I saw, was this uh, robot developed a conscious kind of an AI and wants to do the right thing, wants to be a cop and whatnot, but somehow kids find it and whatnot. And it kind of became this robot trying to find it worth, like kind of, um, uh, what's that? F um, Johnny Five. No, oh, Short Circuit. Yeah, Short Circuit, Johnny Five. So I, I thought it could be something like that, but more cooler because it had guns. Yeah, but... No, from what you're describing to me, why would the creator of the AI created a baby? Why? Just why? It's uh, it it is it is, it questions it makes you question how can this guy keep getting uh, money for 
the movies that he makes because his quality <laughs> winds down, down and down. Like he started as Peter Jackson is the guy that started this guy off. He, they were going to make the Halo movie, then they took the money oh. for that movie and did District Nine. After District Nine, he did Elysium, perhaps the most thinly veiled metaphor about low class and high class that has ever been put together in a movie. And then he makes this one. And the way that he directs is like he thinks he's smarter than you. So he puts all of this symbolism on the screen that I, I hate symbolism, especially when it's hammered down symbolism. And he just, he makes the movie wanting you to go, oh my God, you're so clever, so smart and so deep. You are so talented. When in fact he isn't. He is an right down to the core, absolute hack of a director. And he's really bad about it. I'm actually really mean on the movie right now, but it's seriously, it, that, that movie sucks. It's really bad. Yeah, I kind of like uh, him in District 9, because District 9 was kind of a surprising movie. But, ugh, no, well, like, it, was the, it was the underdog of 2009, I guess. And I, I was intrigued by at least the sci-fi aspect of Elysium, though I did see the, the healthcare <laughs> metaphor. Although, although, hey, just a side note on Elysium, even though it's not this year, we can't really include it in the list. The guy's kind of wrong at the end of the movie. The Earth is dying of overpopulation. Now you're going to give healthcare at all to sustain a population that's going to starve itself to death? I mean, I don't know if it's as happy an ending as the guy's trying to say it is. It's a very cynical movie. And that's perhaps the thing is that this guy directs from a very cynical point of view. And I think that his ideas are not that cynical. He should change the way he's directing. Also, the cartooniness of the villains, it's always something that gets to me. They are over-the-top villains that you'd see in an 80s movie before they get shot in the head 50 times by Mel Gibson. It's not good. Come on. They can do so much better. So before we officially end this, I, I want to put out a surprise. Uh, movies that you're expecting for 2016? Oh my gosh, okay. Well, I'm expecting movies to air. I expect them to air in movie theaters. Uh, that's about it. No. Yeah, I mean, like, any uh, movies that you're expecting, like, um, kind of giddy to watch for, for 2016? Well, let's see. I think really the only one I'm a really aware of right now, and I guess my excitement for movies has thinned out a little, uh, Captain America Civil War. Oh, Same yeah, here. that's a good one. Same here. I- I'm, I can't think of any other movies I know are coming out. Well, uh, I'll, I'll let you time to Google it because I'm Googling right now. So uh, for me, I'll say I'm excited to watch Captain America Civil War and then Deadpool. Oh, yes, Deadpool. And <laughs> Kung Fu Panda 3. Why not, right? That one is going to be fun. Kung Fu Panda 3 is going to be fun. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, okay. I, I do agree with Captain America uh, Civil War as well. I... Just from what Disney said, don't worry, we are not following the comic. I'm like, good, good, we're safe. Are you sure? <laughs> they said that. They said, no, yeah. we know that the comic had a lot of problems. We are not following it. For them to follow the comic, they will have to have the rights of uh, Fantastic Four and the X-Men. And they don't. Yeah. So they are definitely not following the comic. They're only taking the title. Which I think will be the best idea because the title is awesome. The the comic is is crap. Okay. Uh oh, another one here. Uh, TMNT two. Uh, let's uh, let me just get things out of the way here for uh, for stuff I'm not I know exists, but I'm not looking forward to it. All right. Uh, Passengers. I just did a search for 2016 movies, and it looks like. It is the main actress of the Hunger Games with a bow and arrow, but apparently oh, it's, it's going to be, yeah, Jennifer Lawrence is her name? Jennifer Lawrence is uh, the main character of uh, Hunger Games, yeah, the main actress. Mm-hmm. Well, apparently they're just taking her visibility as a Hunger Games heroine and putting it in, in another. Then there's Ninja Turtles 2. Not high quality? No, oh no, no, I'm avoiding that at all costs. All right. I will end up seeing Gods of Egypt because my friend is a huge fan of Egyptian mythology, but it looks like it's going to be Clash of the Titans. But doesn't he know that Egypt is evil? Linkara said so. Oh, well, they... they uh, wait, when? After, <laughs> uh-huh. For a minute there, I thought that was the Greek one where they battled Jesus on the cross, but... <laughs> <laughs> then there's the Divergent series Allegiant. Oh, yeah. oh boy. And let's see here. 
Batman v Superman. Oh, 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 I wanted to watch that just because. Uh, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not Marvel. Okay, so. I just saw it. Okay. Oh, and then there's the questionable Suicide Squad. Oh, God. Oh, I just wanted to watch in, that. Wait a minute. Is that it coming out in 2016 as well? Uh, yep. Apparently. Yep. Ooh, mm-hmm. you know, I am actually looking forward to that one because the director of Suicide Squad is David Ayer and he directed Fury. And I always saw the concept of Suicide Squad as a, a comic book version of the Dirty Dozen. And the Dirty Dozen is one of the best war movies ever made. So if he took the approach of shoot it as a version of the Dirty Dozen with super villains, I'm all game for it. That would be fun. James, all I have to say is don't get your hopes too high. It's no, I don't DC. care. I, am, I, I, um... It's not that that's that doesn't indicate anything. I am actually among the few people who kind of like the look of Jared Leto as the new Joker. Oh, I'm not saying anything bad about it. I'm just saying don't put your hopes too high because it's still oh, DC. No, don't worry, don't worry. My hopes are where they are supposed to be. And still, were you saying exciting movies you want to watch? Exciting movies I want to watch. Here we go. Uh, let's see here. Just scroll up the list. I confess, I am curious about this Warcraft movie. I don't have. <laughs> High expectations, but I'm curious. Oh, by the way, someone asked, do you play Warcraft? Uh, I do not. I've never played. Uh, all right. I've tried Destiny, but even, and we did a, a podcast just talking about that. Mm-hmm. Which, it was interesting. Uh, okay. X-Men Apocalypse and Deadpool. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, X-Men Apocalypse. I looked, I saw the trailer. I don't know what's going on in it. <laughs> The trailer is so weird. Uh, let's see. Just just scrolling through titles that they're really... What about Zootopia? Oh, that Zootopia. looks Oh, fun. yeah. That looks hilarious. Oh, I want to watch that That looks one like too. a lot of fun. Yeah. A- yeah. Anyone who's been trapped at a DMV knows what that feels like. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> I like that. That was a good scene. Okay, and I have to revise my opinion on passengers. Apparently, the the photo I saw is... Just a composite of Hunger Games and Guardians of the Galaxy to say Chris Pat and Jennifer Lawrence are going to be in this movie. So thank God they're not... Well, in a sense, they're baking on her Hunger Games iconography, but it's not going to be just Hunger Games retail. Oh, let's, hope, let's hope it's not. You don't want her to get stuck on that uh, kind of role. You don't want her to get typecasted. One can hope. Yeah. Yeah, do you got any any other movies that you're me looking forward to in 2016? But, but to be honest, I'm more open to be surprised. Yeah, I'm more about being surprised. For me, it's just movies that I want to watch, like Doctor Strange. That's another Marvel movie which yeah, I'm gonna. It's good, probably going to be good because it's Marvel. And here's something that I noticed: Assassin's Creed. Huh. Okay. That's going to be a movie. Hope it's good. <laughs> Come on, it's a video game movie thingy. Like, usually those never do well. Uh, because no one knows how to direct them well. Yeah. Oh, oh well. Star Trek Beyond. What about that? Any oh guys want to see that? Uh, looking at the trailer, I actually lost some enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah, same here. I, was, I was kind of like, oh, wind down. This doesn't... Oh. Okay, it's directed by the guy who did The Conjuring and everything. That's going to be fine, but uh, I'm not sure. I don't know what to think of it. Anyway, uh, I think we could declare this one completed. We've been rumbling for like what? A, an hour and a half? Yep, indeed. A good wow. time. A good time, but there's been, a, there were a lot of movies this year. Oh, there were a lot of movies. I, I went, I think I've gone to the movies more than any of the other year. And with that, I ended up leaving some movies out. The way that the release things work in this country is so backwards. Because only now we are getting Steve Jobs released here in Spain. When I watched it in November in Scotland. So it's like, this is ridiculous. It's just licensing, whatever. Yeah, licensing. Oh, well. But yeah, well, guys, uh, I think that we are going to end the review here, uh, the discussion here. Please let us know what you'd consider the best movies of the year, the most disappointing, the most surprising, the worst. Like the same thing that we did here. Uh, we encourage you to do it as well on the comment section because we want to know what you guys think. And besides, if you disagree with whatever we said, please let us know as well. And uh, we are going to leak Norman's house uh, address so you can find him for what he said about the uh, resurrection of F. Attack, fanboys, attack! 
<laughs> go for him. Go for him. Forget about what. Forget about what Silver said about Mockingjay Part Two. <laughs> go for Norman. <laughs> Uh, go both for, go for both of us. At least that'll dwindle the damage. <laughs> I'm used to it. I'll tackle whatever comes. Uh, it's all right. <laughs> F- Silver has a lot of Phoenix Downs. He's gonna be fine. <laughs> there is no right, other yeah. way to explain how you're able to come back to life after you died so many times. Oh, I found the Konami code for the MLP universe. <laughs> oh, cool. But anyway, uh, James, next week, what are you gonna do? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> Probably another uh, episode we should, review? We should actually go back to reviewing our episodes, yeah, because we have yeah. a couple of weeks uh, without talking about uh, episodes. Yeah. We should talk about episodes again. And there's, yeah. a, hey. and there's a comic that just completed a four-part arc. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. We should talk about that. Oh, my gosh. I'm dreading it. I'm <sighs> dreading it so badly. I so have to talk about the way the fandom reacted to that comic and the way that it, <laughs> oh, the yeah. way that it put its concerns on the comments oh, like yeah. on the daily. Oh, that's Ooh. gonna be fun. Oh, yeah. I, I have I have things to say about the comic. My opinions change a lot. I'm sharpening and... my axe as I'm talking. And I guess I'm preparing my shield for it. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be cool. This is gonna be cool. It's so anyway, gonna... I I'm I'm guessing that next week's gonna be uh, an episode review. I forgot what episode we did. Um, what was it again? Uh, we would be talking about, uh, what about Discord, right? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I, I think so. Well, yes. what about him? What about him? Yeah. A lot of things about the, a lot of things about this thinly veiled reference to a Bill Murray movie. Yeah. <laughs> and after that, I think we're gonna do the comic? The Siege yeah. of the Crystal Empire? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we could talk about what about Discord and then followed by the Siege of the Crystal Empire. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, we had fun. We had a lot of fun. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion and please do comment and rate us and stuff like give us the thumb up because we love it. <laughs> and what, I, what else can I say? Thank you for being with us for this year. Like this year has been much fun. This year has been a lot of fun indeed. Very much. All right. So thank you guys so much for checking it out. I will see you all on the next episode. This has been James Cork. And I am Norman Sanzo, the guy who dislikes the resurrection of Earth. And I'm just a guy who doesn't like tween movies. And you can deal with that. Yeah! <laughs> see you all, guys, next time. Have a good one, everybody. See ya. Adios. No better way to start the year than with the goddamn fanfare. My god, man. Game